Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the writings of the Apostle Paul. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that when we put them all together, we can understand what he's saying. Father, help us to rightly divide your word. Um, please send your spirit to guide us this morning as we analyze this challenging passage in Romans 14. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but uh, here we go. Let's go ahead, sweetie. Romans 14. Oh, we're going to review Romans 13 first. Uh, Romans 13 discusses the responsibility of Christians, uh, their responsibility toward the government. Um, that, of course, we looked at uh, a few weeks ago now. Uh, number two, Paul makes it clear that government is to be honored as long as they don't seek to legislate the first table of the Decalogue. That was something that Roger Williams, I think it made him the greatest American, um, he understood that. It was okay for government to legislate the second table of the law, how we deal with each other. But when a government steps in and tells us how to worship God or when to worship God, then government has crossed the line. Then government should be disobeyed. But as long as government is only legislating the second table of the Decalogue, they are to be honored. Uh, that's biblical. That's from the spirit of prophecy. We've got to deal with it. Christ, Paul, and Peter said we are obligated to pay taxes. I don't know why I put by there, but to pay taxes regardless of the corruption in government. You know, I know we sometimes think, well, you know, government's so corrupted, therefore it's okay for us to disobey. I think Henry David Thoreau, the 19th century author, wrote the book called Civil Disobedience. Um, in the light of Scripture and the spirit of prophecy, Henry David Thoreau was not correct. And that's the polite way of saying it. Uh, number four, this obligation is part of honoring and loving our fellow man. So that's Romans 13 in a nutshell. Now let's get to Romans 14. And again, I hope I don't burst anybody's bubble. Go ahead, sweetie. Let's take a look in Romans 14. Verses 1 through 4. Let's take a look at this. Listen carefully. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputa disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Now let's stop right there, folks. Let's stop right there and let's just look right at that one verse and let's not look at any other verses around it because we certainly don't want to get a balanced view of what Paul is saying, do we? So what did Paul say right here? One believes that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Now, who's the one that's weak? Come on, tell me who's the one that's weak. The vegetarian is a weakling, but to the contrary, the person who eats anything that moves, crawls, breathes, and sees, if they're not weak, what are they? They're strong, that's right. So, folk, hey, if we're going to take, if we're going to look at Scripture now, and we're going to take one verse and keep separated from everything, else a vegetarian is a weakling okay are you a weakling i thought as a seventh day adventist we believe that the bible and the spirit of prophecy were in harmony with each other aren't they and ellen white said we should be vegetarians didn't she but the apostle paul right there 
there a different way to look at that? Is it possible that we need to look at verses above what Paul said there and below what Paul said there? Is it possible that to rightly understand that we need to understand what was going on in Paul's day? Is that possible? We're going to come up to a verse in a few minutes. Okay, the one that's weak in the faith, receive ye not to doubtful disputations. Okay. Is Paul saying in that verse, folks, now come on, come on now. Is Paul saying there that I can eat pigs? Is he saying that? Is he saying that people who, are, who eat pigs are strong? Folk, come on now. Let's rightly divide the word of truth. Let's analyze what Paul is saying, what was going on in Paul's day. If we don't, folk, if we don't and we narrowly understand this verse, the weaklings are the vegetarians and the strong people are those who eat anything under the sun. Come on now. Paul goes on. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God has received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now, folk, if we're going to rightly understand these passages, we need to understand what was going on in Paul's day. Okay? Number one, there were Jews who were, had become Christians. And there were Gentiles that had become Christians. Now, back in ancient times, when people would offer sacrifices or offer their flesh foods, and they would dedicate them to idols... Sometimes, folk, people that did that, if they were weak in the faith, if they had just come into Christianity, they said, oh, no, I, I can't eat that sacrifice to idols. Because to them it would be sinful to do it. And so Paul said, those who are weak in the faith, don't, don't give them all these different standards. And he said, if people who are weak in the faith don't want to eat something sacrificed to an idol, leave them alone. Don't judge them over it. Superficial readers of these verses would have Paul telling us that the people who eat vegetables are weak and that the strong folk are the ones who eat everything, clean and unclean meats. Is this what Paul's talking about? Is he rewriting all of the Old Testament health laws on diet? Next slide, sweetie. Oh, yummy pig. Mmm, 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 good. Folk, probably the most famous council in the early Christian church had to do with how do we deal with the Gentiles? What laws do we tell them to follow? What things do we tell them they don't have to follow? And then within all of what we encourage them to do and not to do, how are we going to deal with them if they continue to do certain things? That whole study is found in Acts chapter 15. It details a great council in Jerusalem, and it looked at the great issues facing the early church and the Gentile converts. What things from Judaism would remain in the new church? What things would the Gentiles be encouraged to follow? What things would pass away? 
she says, this question was warmly, warmly discussed in the assembly. You bet it was warmly discussed because there were Jews who were saying, all the Gentiles have got to be circumcised. They have to be circumcised. Paul and Peter said, no, they don't. No, they don't. How about the feast days? Some of the Jews in the early church said, all the feast days have got to be kept. Paul said, no, they don't. Health laws. Sacrificing. Did the people still have to offer sacrifices? Yes or no? How about the Ten Commandments? Yes or no? Paul says, intimately connected with the question of circumcision were several others demanding careful study. One was the problem as to what attitude should be taken toward the use of meats offered to idols. I don't know, Jim. It's all right. Many of the Gentile converts were living among ignorant and superstitious people who made frequent sacrifices and offerings to idols. Isn't that interesting, folk? If we don't understand what was going on in the first century, we can make a mockery of what Paul was saying, can't we? If we don't understand the issues, we can have Paul saying all kinds of crazy things. The Holy Spirit saw good not to impose the ceremonial law on the Gentile converts. And the mind of the apostles regarding this matter was as the mind of the Spirit of God. James presided at the council, and his final decision was, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. That's Acts of the Apostles, page 191 and 194. This was heated, folks, heated in the first century. Next slide, sweetie. Paul said that circumcision was worthless. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. Paul said circumcision is worthless. Why did he have Timothy circumcised? Did you know he had Timothy circumcised? Was Paul a hypocrite? Now, come on, folks. Was he or wasn't he? He said circumcision was worthless, and then he had Timothy circumcised. Why? Why? Okay, okay Jim, he, he felt that if Paul understood very clearly that circumcision had no salvational value, but he knew that if Timothy were not circumcised, that both Paul's influence and Timothy's influence amongst Jews would be completely destroyed. Well, Timothy's mother, Nellie, Timothy's mother was a convert. She was a convert to Christianity. Her dad was, his dad wasn't. Yeah. So everybody knew that Timothy had not been circumcised as a youth. Therefore, Paul said, in order for Timothy to have influence among the Jews, I'm going to go ahead and have him be circumcised. Paul said the feast days pointed to Christ and were beggarly elements. If you read in Colossians 2, 14 to 17, he said the feast days were shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So he said the feast days pointed forward to Jesus Christ. In Galatians 4, 9, and 10, he chastised the Galatians. He said, are you going to turn back to those beggarly elements from which you've been delivered? Now, the same guy that said this in Colossians 2, 14 to 17, in Galatians 4, 9, and 10, did you know that Paul kept some of the feast days? Did you know that? The Bible says that he rushed to Jerusalem that he might keep Pentecost. 
Acts 18.21 tells us that. Why? Was Paul crazy? Was he a weirdo? Come on, folks, think for a minute. Think for a minute. You know, people, I've listened to people who will come up to me and say, well, did you read Acts 18.21? And I said, I think I've read Acts 18.21. And they say, that verse right there says that Paul kept Pentecost. Therefore, we should be able to keep the feast days. Folks, do we take one verse do we take one passage of Scripture, and based on that one passage of Scripture, we build a doctrine? Is that how we understand the Bible? Come on. Come on. Why? How could Paul say these things and then keep Pentecost? How could he do that? Why did he keep Pentecost, folks? Reggie, why did he do it? That's exactly right, Reggie. It's for the same reason for why he had Timothy circumcised. Because the Apostle Paul understood very clearly that the feast days were passing away. But Paul also understood that there would be thousands, yea, millions of Jews in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And so Paul said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be there at Pentecost so that by my influence, I may reach, yea, thousands of people. But folks, if we isolate a passage of Scripture and we build an idea around one verse, are we rightly understanding the Bible? No. No, we're not. We've got to be balanced. Paul was dealing with Pharisaical Jews and heathen Gentile converts from two extremes. He didn't want to be a stumbling block toward anyone. He didn't want to critical judgment to be manifest among the believers towards those strong in the faith and toward the weak in the faith. As people grew in their understanding of God's will, Paul encouraged tolerance and patience toward one another, not intolerance, rudeness, and cruelty toward those who didn't see it the way they did. Paul felt this way on non-salvational issues, not on issues relating to Christ and the Ten Commandments. Next slide, please. Those weak in faith should be received even, even though they may not see all truth. For a conscientious newcomer, something may be wrong for them to do, but for one more mature in the faith, the same thing may not be wrong. a stumbling block and don't be judgmental. If people, some of the weaker brethren, couldn't eat things sacrificed to idol, leave them alone. That's fine. Just don't 
cause the weaker ones in the faith to stumble and lose their way. Next slide, Steve. 5 and 6. Now, before we read these verses, I need to ask a question. What day of the week do we think is the day we should go to church on? The Sabbath. And a lot of people in our world go to church on what day? On Sunday. Okay. Now, we've understood that based on the fourth commandment and the, the spirit of prophecy, right? But I, I'm pretty sure, folk, and I think you will agree with me if we look at this one verse that Paul is saying something much, much different than that. Are you ready? Are you ready to look at Scripture? Here we go. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Now, what did that verse just say? Now, you read it. What did it just say? Come on now. Be fair. One man esteems one day. Now, what day do we esteem? The Sabbath. So we esteem the Sabbath. And Paul says, another esteemeth every day alike. How many times have you had a Sunday keeper who you, you've said to them, you know, you really ought to be keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. And they say, oh, you know, you esteem the Sabbath, but we look at all the days the same. Now, did Paul condemn either of these people? We condemn people, don't we? We call people heathens who don't go to church on the Sabbath, right? Come on, we do. What did Paul say? He didn't say that one of them was right. He said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, folk, based on those verses, based on those verses right there, if you read these verse, this verse right here, Romans 14, 5 and 6, I believe that's just in verse 5. If you read this one verse, and you don't understand what was going on when Paul wrote that, and you don't understand the whole body of Scripture and the spirit of prophecy, you know what conclusion you can draw? You can say, I can go to church on any day I want to. Now, can't you draw that conclusion? Yes, you can. Now, is it important that we understand what was going on in Paul's day? Is that important? Or do we just isolate a verse and say, that's what it says, that's what I'm going to do? How do we do it, folks? How do we do it? Well, if we, if we choose to isolate the verse, like most Sunday keepers do, then I can go out to church on any day of the week I want to. And I'm persuaded in my mind that I can keep Sunday, and you're persuaded that you can keep Sabbath, and it doesn't make a bit of difference what day I keep. If, if, you're going to isolate one verse and separate it from everything else. Folks, there's a right way to study the Bible, and there's a wrong way to study the Bible. You know, it's kind of like when we were studying about the gift of tongues. You remember those verses in 1 Corinthians 14 where it said that women are supposed to do what in church? They're supposed to be quiet, aren't they? Now, how many of you women just disobeyed what Paul said because you answered me? Come on now, how many of you? All right, Angela, Sarah, did you say something too? All right, Sarah was guilty, Angela was guilty. Jackie, I, did you say something? You said be quiet. All right, so now we've got three, we've got four women that now are guilty of what Paul said, right? We're well, guilty. Now, is that how we study the Bible? Do we take one verse, isolate it from everything else, completely take it out of context, 
don't understand what was going on in the church at that time and then draw our conclusion? Is that how we study the Bible? Folk, if we do, then you ladies better, better be still. <laughs> and you better not tell anybody else what day they can go to church on. Don't you dare do that because Romans 14 says not to. Now, I will suggest an alternative. My alternative is, is that we need to understand this in light of what was going on in the first century. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Paul goes on and says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it to the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Now, folk, I've had people throw those verses in my face and say, I can eat whatever I want and I can go to church on whatever day I want and you can't tell me any different. So what was Paul really saying? in these verses, and what were the issues in Paul's day? Next slide, Stephen. Paul was not talking about Sabbath and Sunday in these verses at all. Paul was not a confused man, folks. The issue in the first century had nothing to do with Sabbath and Sunday. But what, were, what was the issue in Paul's day? The issue in Paul's day centered around the keeping of the Jewish feast days. Because you see, there were many Jews in the first century who felt that the feast days were binding. And connected to each one of the feast days was at least one ceremonial Sabbath. Now you can study about that in Leviticus 23. It's also in Numbers chapters 28 and 29. Paul knew that the feast days were no longer binding. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says that. But he told the brethren in Rome, he admonished the brethren not to be judgmental of those who still kept them or didn't keep them. So, in Romans 14, when Paul says one man esteems one day above another, another man esteems all of them alike, Paul was saying, you know, there's some, there's some in here that think the ceremonial Sabbath connected to Passover is very important. And others think that the ceremonial Sabbaths connected to the Feast of Tabernacles are crucial. Paul said, let them alone. Let everybody be fully persuaded in their own mind. Don't be judgmental about that. He said, over time, the feast days are going to pass away. Now, it's fascinating that the feast days have risen up in our day again. Again, in something like this, Paul advised tolerance and tenderness, not harshness and cruelty. Those who made the feast days an issue of salvation Paul came across stronger. And notice what Paul said in Galatians 4. He said, after you have known God or are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Paul said, you observe days and months and times and years. Folk, the only time in the Bible where days and months and times and years are put together is in connection to the Jewish feast days. And that's what Paul is telling the Galatians. He said, why have you turned away from Jesus Christ and submission to him, and now you've gotten back involved in the feast days? You see, folk, the key thing about issues is that we don't think some issue is going to save us. No issue is going to save anybody. 
The only one that's going to save us is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus will save us as we are willing to submit to him. No issue is going to save us. Next slide, Scooter. Romans 14, 7 to 10. Paul asked, he said, None of us liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. Whether we live, we live to the Lord. Whether we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So Paul says, who are we living for? Who are we living for? Do we live? You know, John Donne, that famous, uh, I think he was a, a writer, an English writer. He said, no man is an island. And he's right. No man is an island. We all, we all have influence. How are we using our influence? What are we making the focal point of our influence? Is it harshness? and demanding that people do as we think God wants us to do? Paul says, none of us live to ourselves. And then he gives Christ as an example. Christ used his influence to win, to save, to uplift. Paul then asked, why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See, some of us make our religion out of looking down our nose at other people and determining whether someone else has come up to the standard that I think is what God wants us to do. And anybody that doesn't meet our standard, we judge as lost or going to hell in a peach basket. We've got to be careful with that, folks. Paul was very concerned about the people in the, Ro the church at Rome. So judgmental. If somebody wasn't doing it just the way somebody else thought, they were so rude about it. Got to be careful with that. Next slide, Scooter. We're all responsible to someone. We all have a certain sphere of influence in others' lives. We need to use our influence wisely and effectively toward the salvation of others. Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20, 28. Obviously, being judgmental was a great problem in the lives of the Roman Christians, and Paul nailed it. People were setting themselves up as the final word, using their influence to tear down others, rather than to build them up in their walk. Brethren were being separated over the littlest of things. You know, it's too bad. I mean, you know, over the years, we've had people come through our church that have split away from us because we've had had fruits and vegetables at our lunch meal. And, uh, you know, we've had other people accuse us of being heretical because we don't wear all, all of uh, white clothing or all black clothes. Uh, you know, you get all kinds of crazy things, all kinds of crazy things. And then we've had some people come through and say, you know, we ought to be having meals that are all fruit. Ooh. You know, we got to be careful, folks. We got to be careful. We got to make sure that we're not setting ourselves up as a final word and using our influence to tear down others rather than to build people up. Next slide, Scooter. Romans 14, 11 to 13. Are we involved in judging others or are we a stumbling block? 
Paul said, as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You know, this gentleman I work with on the radio, he told me that his mother used to take his family to a Seventh-day Adventist church when they were little. But they left because the people in the church, in this Adventist church, made them feel like if they didn't accept the spirit of prophecy by a certain time, and if they didn't cook meals a certain way by a certain time, then they weren't Seventh-day Adventists. They were heathens. Is that our job? Is that our job to look into to look around and say, "Oh, well, you know, Bill, he he wears a tie, and uh, sometimes it's it's stuffed into his pants." Uh, you know, I I think he's a heathen for that. Is that our job? Look, we got to be careful. Got to be careful. We've got to give account of ourselves to God, not to each other. It's not our job to judge one another. We just better be sure we're not putting a stumbling block in our brother's way. That's what we've got to be careful about. Next slide, sweetie. How am I using my influence? Am I constantly judging others and being critical? Am I tearing down others to make myself feel better? That typically is why we do that. We condemn and judge other people because we don't feel right about ourselves. And we set up standards because it makes us feel good. Does my influence win people or does it drive people away? Paul was deeply concerned over the lack of kindness, kindness and tolerance in Rome and the horrible push to condemn and judge others instead. Next slide. There's my buddy. Romans 14, 14, and 15, Paul said, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Did you hear that? Dennis, would you run out to the kitchen and tell Faye and Rita to get out my pig? I wanted to have a slice of ham for lunch today. That's what the Bible says. I read it. Nellie, did you just, you saw what that said, didn't you? You saw it. Charles, Tabitha, hey, Charles, Barbara, David, I'm just getting this side of the church. You guys saw that verse, right? All right, let's get out our, our pork ribs, huh? Let's get out our pork for lunch today. Him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. But Paul said there isn't anything that's unclean of itself. That fellow ain't unclean anymore, according to the Apostle Paul. That's what he said. You see how far we can go, folk, if we take a verse and we eliminate it from the context? And we eliminate it from what was going on at that time in earth's history. We can eat anything. We can go to church any day we want to. We can, do, we can do anything we want and think we've got our ticket into the kingdom. We, we've got to be careful how we dissect the Bible. Got to be very careful. If thy brother be grieved with thy meat... Now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Is this guy now clean? Some would have us think so. And the way some of us interpret scripture, 
we would say so. Number one, folks, when Paul here talks about meat, the word is broma, comes from the Greek word bromata. It simply means food. Whenever Paul uses the word meat throughout his writings, it's a general term, broma or bromata, which simply means food. That's what it means. There's a totally different word that Paul uses when he refers to flesh that, we, that was being eaten. Totally different word. Next slide, sweetie. Let's take a look. Paul's issue is not over clean and unclean meat. His issue is over how we treat others whose conscientious scruples disagree with ours. The word for meat is broma, which means food. If your weaker brother is offended by you eating something, and for him it's a conscientious issue, don't do it in front of him and cause him or her to stumble. That was Paul's issue. If there's something that you can eat that you don't believe is sinful, that you know does not bother you, but it bothers somebody else, don't eat it in front of them. Don't walk up and be, you know, eating it. Oh, hi. And that would cause a weaker person to stumble. That's Paul's point here. Be sensitive to others and how they feel. How can we say we love others when we intentionally offend weaker souls and cause them to stumble because we want to stand for the truth? Boy, that's dangerous, folk, to stand for the truth. I think you understand what I mean. You know, the Jews were standing for the truth that Friday morning when they killed Christ. So we got to be careful on what we proclaim to be truth and how we handle that truth. That was Paul's issue in Romans 14. Next slide. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Again, the word here for meat is broma, meaning food. The kingdom of God is not food and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, folk, I don't, I don't want to hit a dead dog when it's down. I think I've hit the dog enough times today. The kingdom of God is not food and drink. One verse separated from everything else in the Bible, and what can you conclude from that one verse? What can you say? The kingdom of God is not food and drink, so what can I eat then? Anything I want. And what can I drink then? Anything I want. I hope you're getting the point this morning. Don't isolate passages of the Bible, separate them from the rest of Scripture, and then build an idea on that and think it's important. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. In our individual lives at home or at the workplace, if we can avoid trouble, do it. Don't go about to try to create problems. Because I'm standing for the truth? Come on, folk. We need to be sensitive. And that's what Paul's getting at here. The people in Roman were tearing each other up over standing for what was right. Got to be careful. Next slide. Paul's comments are interesting. Food and drink are important only as they influence our mind and body to do certain things. Stimulating or tiring our mind and body leads to poor thinking and consequently poor decisions. What is most important is that we are following what is right and living in peace with others by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Proper health habits will put us in a position to hear the Spirit's voice. We need to be careful. Next slide. Finally, Romans 14, 20 to 23. For food, destroy not the work of God. I thought the health message was important, isn't it? Take that out of context, separate it from what Paul is saying. You can say that health's not important, diet's not important. That's not what Paul is saying there. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It's good neither to eat flesh. There's a different word there. That means eating uh, clean meat. Nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This idea runs throughout Romans 14. When you're dealing with issues, whether it be with eating or with the feast days, if it's going to cause another person to stumble who is weak in the faith or to offend them, don't do it around them. If it's something that you think is okay, don't offend them. Next slide. Throughout the New Testament, it's important to understand that the word for meat is broma, which means food. The word for flesh is kreis. This means animal flesh. Eat wisely, but don't offend others in the process. Be careful not to cause another brother to stumble by what you are doing. This is Paul's whole argument in Romans 14. What we choose to do, do it before God and not to display before others. Let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Thank you for your word. Please forgive us for all the times that we have not rightly divided your word. Thank you for your amazing patience with each one of us. Please strengthen us to be gentle and kind to others who may not see things as we do if they're new in the faith. Please help us as we study to get a balanced picture of the Bible and what the meaning of Scripture is. In Jesus' name I pray.